1976, a filming crew for the show The Six Million Dollar Man was filming at the New Pike Amusement Center in Long Beach, California. While preparing to shoot a scene in the park's fun house, a crew member noticed a mannequin hanging awkwardly by its neck from a noose in the background. As the crew member attempted to remove the mannequin from the shot, its arm broke off, revealing human flesh. Hi, my name is Tasha and this is my series White Rabbit where we deep dive into anything spooky, odd, or just interesting while I apply some special effects makeup. Today's story is about a failed career criminal who after his death would spend 65 years traveling the U.S. as part of a sideshow attraction. Today's makeup will be skeleton inspired hands. Before we get into all of that, please remember that the easiest way to support me is by liking, commenting, or subscribing to the channel so that you don't miss any future uploads. Now let's get into the story. Elmer McCurdy was born January 1st, 1880 in Washington, Maine to an impoverished family. His mother was 17-year-old Sadie McCurdy and his father was unknown. In the 1880s, to be an unwed mother was a great source of shame and a lot of women would hide their pregnancies or give their babies away. This is exactly what happens with Elmer's mother. When her brother found out that Sadie was pregnant, he and his wife offered to adopt the child and raise him as their own. This was supposed to spare her the humiliation of raising a child on her own. Elmer wasn't told about the adoption until after his father passed away from tuberculosis when he was a teenager. When he did find out, he took it really hard. He felt so betrayed by the women in his life that he actually started to rebel. And this is when he developed the habit of coping by alcohol. And that habit follows him throughout his entire life. Elmer ended up going to Maine with his grandfather where sometimes he would work as a plumber and sometimes he would work as a miner. But he never kept a job for long, partly because of his alcoholism and partly because of the economy at the time. In 1907, Elmer joined the army where he worked as a machine gun operator and he also got some minor explosives training. And it was after this explosives training that Elmer decided he wanted to incorporate explosives into a life of crime. In 1911, Elmer managed to convince three men to join him in becoming this outlaw gang that would rob banks and trains. They agreed and their first job was supposed to be this train that was carrying about $4,000. In today's money, that would be about $130,000. Technically, everything was going according to plan. They did manage to stop the train on the tracks. They managed to get to the safe. Elmer's job in this gang was to handle the explosives. Remember I told you he had some slight training in the military? Apparently, it wasn't enough because he let off this massive explosion in this little train car. Not only did he destroy the safe, he destroyed the money inside and he destroyed a majority of the train car. That was the only sign this group of men needed. They didn't want to do any more robberies with him, but Elmer didn't care because he quickly got together another outlaw gang. This time, the target was the Citizens Bank. I don't know why they decided to rob the bank this way, but instead of going through the front door, they went around to the back and they hammered at the brick wall for two hours until they finally broke through. Two hours. Two whole hours hammering a brick wall. That must have hurt. They must have been so loud. So anyway, they get through this wall and it's time for Elmer to do his job again. Now, Elmer does manage to blow the door of the vault open, but he didn't realize that the money was inside a safe inside of the vault. So he wasn't prepared to have to let off another explosive. But basically he's like, okay, I gotta do what I gotta do. So he lets off another explosive. Except for he doesn't let off another explosive because it doesn't even ignite. At this point, it's taking way too long and the police are on their way because 
there was just an explosion. So they have to leave. The lookout man had already run off because they were taking way longer than planned. They did manage to steal $150 in coins that was sitting on a tray outside of the safe. Today that would be less than $5,000 and he had to split it at least with the person that stayed. Definitely wasn't worth the trouble, definitely wasn't worth the risk. In March of 1911, Elmer learned of a train headed to Kansas from Oklahoma. Now this train was delivering a payment to the Osage Nation, which is a Midwestern tribe of the Great Plains. A Midwestern tribe of the Great Plains. Close. So Elmer knew that there would be a significant amount of money on this train. The rumor was the train was carrying $400,000. That's like 12 and a half million today. So technically everything was going as planned. They were able to stop the train on the tracks, hop the train, and they were like ready to blow this safe and just get out of there as soon as possible. Except for they were on the wrong train. They were actually on a regular passenger train. The outlaws didn't want to leave with nothing, so they just rounded up the passengers and they robbed them instead, collecting a grand total of $45 and two jugs of whiskey. So in today's money, they would have gotten about $350 each. They also got a revolver and the conductor's coat. I don't know why they wanted that, but they wanted that. This incident apparently held the record for the smallest train robbery. Small or not, the police were onto him now and there was even a cash reward of $2,000. He ended up being tracked to this hay shed where he was just laying low and drinking all of the whiskey that he stole. He was never quite able to kick that habit. Anyway, he was tracked to this hay shed and when Elmer saw the police, he opened fire. This started a shootout which ultimately ended in Elmer getting fatally shot in the chest. At this point, saying the story takes an unusual turn is an understatement at best. I don't have words to explain what this man was put through after death. After he was shot, Elmer's body was taken to an undertaker named Joseph Johnson. Joseph performed his autopsy and Elmer's body was identified by three people, I believe, one of which was the sheriff. Joseph thought it might be a while before someone came to claim his body, so when he was embalming him, he used an excess of chemical. Well, Elmer never was claimed and his body actually started to mummify at the funeral home. I don't know what kind of people resided in this town, but when the townspeople found out, they wanted in. They were like, I, I want to see this mummy. Initially, Joseph refused. He was like, I I'm not gonna let you guys come and view this body. But then he had an idea. See, the state not only stuck him with this body that he didn't wanna pay to get buried, but he was also actually never paid for the original services that he performed on the body, like the autopsy. So Joseph Johnson decided to put back on the clothes that Elmer was killed in and prop him up in his funeral home. He started charging admission for people to come in and view the body. There was even a tradition of placing like a coin in Elmer's mouth for good luck, like a human wishing well. The people in this town would go on ice cream dates and then follow it up with a visit to the funeral home to see a dead body. Word starts to get out about Elmer's body being used for an attraction and how much money Joseph was making off of it. So then he started getting offers from people to buy Elmer's body. There was no way he was selling Elmer. He was getting too much money. But eventually Elmer's two brothers showed up to take his body home and to have him laid to rest next to their mother like she wanted. Reluctantly, Joseph did give the body back after being shown the proper documentation. Joseph used Elmer's body for five years before his brothers came to collect him. Surprise, surprise to no one, the documents were fake. These were not Elmer's brothers. They were brothers. Their names were James and Charles Patterson and they owned a traveling carnival from Texas. Elmer became a part of their carnival sideshow 
traveling around the U.S. for about six years until he was sold to another traveling act called the Life of Crime Museum. The owner of this museum took a little bit of a different approach. Not only did he use Elmer's body, but he also rented him out. In 1933, Elmer's body was used to advertise the film Narcotic, and to promote this film, they actually placed his body inside the theaters that were showing the film. After the death of the man that owned the crime museum, Elmer's body was actually just stored in a warehouse with the other wax figures that he owned. In 1967, Elmer's body was rented out again for a film. This one was called She Freak. He was then sold to a Canadian businessman in 1968. The Canadian businessman bought Elmer and he also bought some other wax figures from the Museum of Crime. I don't know what this businessman was doing with Elmer's body, but basically by the time the body came back, he was missing toes and he was basically deemed too gruesome to be showcased anymore. Elmer's body was sold once more to the owner of the Pike Amusement Park in Long Beach, California. They thought they were getting a prop for their fun house, so they painted him in UV paint, threw a noose around his neck, and just hung him in the fun house. This is where he would eventually be discovered when the crew member of that show, The Six Million Dollar Man, accidentally ripped his arm off and saw that it was human flesh on the inside. Investigators ended up working backwards to find out who he was and exactly what had happened to Elmer McCurdy. A few crime enthusiasts from Oklahoma heard about Elmer and they heard about this body and this fun house and who it ended up being and they wanted to work really hard to bring his body back to Oklahoma. Elmer was welcomed back to Oklahoma with a massive funeral. He ended up being placed in a glass horse-drawn hearse. This hearse rode through the town and was escorted by sheriffs and townspeople that were dressed in cowboy hats and they were wearing their guns on their hips. The whole town dressed up to respectfully send him off. They escorted Elmer's body to the cemetery where he would be buried next to a famous Oklahoma outlaw named Bill Doolin. Elmer's casket was lowered into the ground using these big lasso type ropes. A beautiful eulogy was delivered highlighting that this was the type of respect that Elmer deserved and not the treatment that his body got. Following the funeral, large amounts of cement were layered on top of Elmer's casket so that he could never be exploited again. I hope you enjoyed this week's story. It had me a bit on a roller coaster. I thought the beginning was pretty funny, like his life of crime, because he wanted to be a criminal so bad and he just was not. But then it was so sad, the disrespect that his body endured for so long. I'm happy that he was able to be sent off in a way that is humane and respectful well maybe humane is not the word but definitely respectful let me know what you guys think i am dying to talk about this i hope you enjoyed my skeletal inspired hand remember i post makeup tutorials on my tiktok and my ig which you can find below thank you again for watching remember to like comment and subscribe so you don't miss any future uploads see you next time